Good evening, everyone. Tonight we'll be discussing emperors of late antiquity and working our way primarily in the West all the way up to the fall of Rome in 476 AD. To begin, we're going to start with an interesting character called Julian the Apostate. Um, I'll call him, I think he's interesting, obviously, because he has the apostate tag at the end of his name, which of course he didn't choose. Um, but I also find him interesting because in many ways he's just the sort of guy that you would like actually to have um, in charge of a country like America where you have a diversity of religions all trying to get along. But in the fourth century when Christianity was in the ascendancy, he was in fact uh, demonized and labeled as the apostate. And interestingly also he's the last of the Constantinian dynasty as you notice there. So the dynasty begun with Constantine the Great ends here kind of with the supposed enemy of Christianity. Now, how did he, let's talk a little bit about his life before we get into some of his um, religious reforms. He had been um, Caesar under Constantine's son and successor, Constantius II, and uh, was soon declared Augustus by his own troops while Constantius was still alive. Um, this, of course, caused civil war to break out between him and Constantius, but it never really got off the ground because Constantius died long before any battle was waged. Um, however, ironically, even on the eve of battle, Constantius still kind of admitted that Julian was the next guy in charge. Um, Julian uh, had done a lot of his campaigning against the Germani and was um, sort of familiar with the frontier warfare that was fairly common in the day. He was also highly educated he was um, the author of several books that are still, some of which are still in existence today. He was a philosopher. He was, um, you know, obviously wrote a lot of correspondence, even wrote some hymns and um, I think possibly some plays. Now, the more interesting thing about him, of course, is that he attempted this pagan renewal. Not so much at the expense of Christianity, but in an attempt to kind of reestablish this plurality of religions in Rome to give everybody kind of equal treatment again. So let's look a little bit at the details of that. First of all, he restored these temples, not like in the sense of uh, redecorating them, but more in the sense of uh, giving them back because uh, many of the temples had actually just been confiscated under Constantine and handed over to the churches. Uh, a lot of the bishops and other uh, clergy of the church had been given stipends and they had been also given other kinds of special privileges and rights, special access to the emperor and special offices in the state. All of that was taken away. Uh, Julian removed all of that and sort of put these guys back on just kind of normal standing along with everybody else. Um, he was actively, you know, you can see this as a kind of persecution. He was actively trying to kind of cleanse upper levels of government of any kind of high-ranking Christian official. He passed something called the School Edict. <laughs> Interesting, this sounds so relevant to our own world, but he passed a school edict in which uh, he actually required all teachers to kind of have official imperial approval, uh, approval, and he actually required the teaching of Homer's epics in the day, which would have, in his day, precluded any Christian from uh, being a teacher in any of the Roman schools. Any, I'm thinking of Roman schools here that are subsidized by the government. And so all these Christian teachers were, you know, kind of forced out because they couldn't in good conscience use Homer's edicts, I mean Homer's epics, so a little irony there, I think. Uh, finally, in 362, he issued this tolerance edict. Again, something that to us Americans sounds like perfectly common sense. Um, it just said, you know, all religions are going to be treated equally, um, but to the Christians who had been enjoying a kind of uh, privileged status, this was um, an affront and seemed to be a loss. Um, on his way out, really, uh, one of his last acts to attempt to kind of reestablish some non-Christian religions was that he actually ordered the temple to be rebuilt. And uh, there was, you know, a little bit of movement in that direction, but for a variety of reasons, it never got off the ground. And the temple is still in ruins to this day. Now, moving from Julian on, we have um, a guy after him called Jovian who rules for a whopping eight months and again restores Christianity to its place as the favored religion in Rome. Jovian was succeeded by Valentinian. Now Dal Valentinian had a long, relatively long, and eventful reign, so a good 11 years on the throne there, and 
he had a lot of things to deal with. Uh, first of all, in Britain, all of the various Celtic tribes that were there, um, they had a variety of different names, but they all joined forces against the Roman legions that were there. So that was that was a major war they had to undertake. And it was also during his day that the Huns were on the move. And they were, of course, now moving through Europe and pushing Germanic tribes up against the frontier borders of the Rhine and the Danube. So Valentinian was one of the last emperors to be waging war on those frontiers that had been established really since uh, Hadrian and Trajan's day. Valentinian, one last kind of fun fact is that he died of a really weird injury. He was in negotiations with a Germanic tribe um, and something they said just set him off and he grew profoundly irate and burst a blood vessel in his own head while he was yelling at the envoys and died as a result of his injuries. Valentinian had actually, upon his accession to the throne, um, appointed his own brother, Valens, to be co-Augustus in the East. And in this way, he was actually renewing the Diocletian model um, of power sharing that had been defunct, really, since, Di uh, since Constantine had taken power, sole power of the empire um, in the early 4th century. Now, the most eventful thing in Valens reigns, and there were lots of other events. For example, there was a huge earthquake at Crete that destroyed a lot of uh, the shoreline along um, especially the, the Greek and uh, Asia Minor areas. A lot of the islands in, in the Aegean there were <clears throat> really sacked by this huge tsunami that was caused by it. But the thing that historically is of most interest is his fight with the Goths, in what's called the Gothic War, and especially the Battle of Adrianople. Now, as we've said before, uh, the Huns were on the move, and this meant that the Germanic tribes were on the run, especially the Goths. And they were lining up against the Danube. Some estimates suggest that there were something like a million people um, seeking um, to cross the Danube into Roman territory for shelter and safety against the... Uh, the invading Huns. Now, if you're hearing echoes of our own day and the news of, you know, ISIS pushing uh, refugees out of their homelands and across the world, even into Europe, and, and uh, these people trying to find a place to stay, and, and the states are saying, you know, we can't take all these people. Every day you hear another, um, another European state that's trying to explain why it can't take all these refugees. Well, if that's all coming to your mind, it should, because this is precisely what was happening in the 4th century. These Goths needed a place to go, and Valens said, you can't come here, there's not enough. Uh, not enough supplies, not enough resources to support you. However, Valens was in need of troops. He was actually stationed down in Antioch. You can see it there in the bottom right-hand corner of the map. Antioch, um, in the southeastern corner of Asia Minor. He was there because he had been waging war against a group called the Sassanids, which were really like the renewal of the Persian Empire. And he had actually lost quite a bit of troops because his brother Valentinian had needed them. So he'd sent his troops back across and it looked like with all these Goths lining up the Danube that there might be a steady supply. So he agreed to let some come through. He said, let's let just a select number come through. He picked a, a military commander among the Goths and said, you and your, your folk can come through. Well, of course, once the, once the gates were open, they just came flooding. And all of a sudden, there were all these people um, crossing the Danube, now in Roman territory, and Valens didn't know, nobody knew what to do with them all because they certainly couldn't feed them. So they started going hungry right away. Tensions between them and the Romans started to grow immediately. Word got out that they could go to a place called Marcianopolis. So you can see Marcianopolis up there, and just above it, you can faintly see the Danube River kind of running right above it. Well, this huge group, hundreds of thousands of Goths, uh, start making the trek there. <clears throat> Insufficient food, uh, no good shelter, and many of them are dying along the way. Some history books will call this the Death March of Marcianopolis. Anyway, they get there after, you know, miles and miles of suffering, and the gates are closed. And this is really kind of the last straw. So these Goths and uh, all the fighting men in them decide, you know, enough's enough. Uh, they actually join up with um, other uh, barbaric tribes, uh, even with 
some contingents of the Huns and wage war against the Romans and begin pushing forward south into uh, Byzantium. Well, now by this time, of course, Valens has left Antioch, moved through Constantinople, and the two forces meet at Adrianople, where um, two thirds of Valens' army are killed in the engagement. So here's the Roman army fighting a desperate refugee army of Goths, and the Romans are decisively defeated. This leaves a big power vacuum, and it is taken over by a guy named Theodosius. It actually isn't taken over. It's actually offered to him. The guy that came after Valens didn't really want the job, and so passed it off to Theodosius, who began ruling in 379 and is going to, as you notice, rule for quite some time. Uh, he is going to be on the throne for a while. Now, he is also an interesting figure because he is just the polar opposite of Julian the Apostate. He is Theodosius the Great, the great Christian emperor who attempted to establish kind of the first state religion of Christianity in the ancient world. Um, he was a staunch supporter, not just of Christianity, but of the particular branch of Christianity called Nicene Christianity, that is the Trinitarian Christianity, the Christianity that believed that Father and Son were of the same being. And that's an important distinction, because the Arian uh, version of Christianity, that practiced by a lot of the Goths, um, did not believe that Jesus was fully co-eternal and co-equal with God. They believed he was in some way created by God, um, even though he wasn't created in the same way that, say, even the angels were. But uh, that's neither here nor there. The point is that Theodosius was very narrow in his support of Christianity. I say very narrow. He was supporting the bulk of Christians at the time who were Orthodox. Okay, so um, he, he officially then declared that Nicene Christianity was the only acceptable version out there. Now, this marginalized all the Arian Christians and, and all these bishops who were essentially out of a job. But he went beyond that. In 381 AD, Theodosius actually started actively suppressing pagan worship, and he just outright closed the temples. I mean, he just shut them down and forbid any open worship of the pagan gods, eventually including the Olympic Games. The last games were held in 393 and in 394, um, Theodosius banned them, and they would not get started again until 1896, just over 1,500 years. Now, keep in mind, that might sound a little extreme to you, but keep in mind that these games were always had always been held in honor of Zeus, and every at every um, at every occurrence of the games, there was a huge sacrifice of animals to Zeus. So it was it was overtly a pagan rite. Well, he did slip up too, though. Uh, so. This is a portrait of uh, Theodosius and the famous Bishop of Milan, St. Ambrose, uh, the bishop who was, in fact, very influential in Augustine's conversion. And here you'll notice the, the posture of Theodosius is one of submission, and the posture of uh, the bishop there is one of authority. And um, what's happening here is that the, the bishop is actually reprimanding and excommunicating Theodosius. Why, you ask? Well, because Theodosius uh, kind of lost his cool, and when there was a riot in Thessalonica, yes, that's the same one that got the letters from Paul, Thessalonica, there was, a, there was this riot, and um, basically Theodosius ordered um, some Gothic soldiers under his command there to just massacre this rioting civilian population. Um, St. Ambrose was outraged at this atrocity and uh, excommunicated Theodosius, wouldn't allow him to take communion in any of the churches, and only readmitted him after several months of penance. Now, when uh, Theodosius died, he left the empire split again. So he put one of his sons in the east and one of his sons in the west, and this is where we're going to really turn our attention to the west. It's going to be kind of a hop, skip, and a jump to the, jump to the fall. But we start out here with Honorius um, in the West. Uh, has a pretty long reign, as you can see, over 20 years long. Um, and that's understandable because, as this picture suggests, he was very young when he came to the throne. Uh, in fact, the age of nine. Uh, not at all a respected, well-respected emperor. Not in his own day and not in the, um, not in the history books. Um, it was during his reign that Alaric the Visigoth 
uh, came and laid siege to Rome. He laid siege for several years until in 410 he broke through. Well, I shouldn't say broke through. Uh, by that time, people were starving inside the city. They were frustrated by Honorius's lack of decisiveness, and someone just frankly opened the door. And as you know from our reading of City of God, these folks came in and began to have their way with the city. Except, that is, for those people who were hiding inside the shrines and basilicas of the Christians. And again, that's partly because, at least um, partly because, the Visigoths were probably Christians themselves. Arians, albeit, but Christians. Um, during this time, Britain and Iberia, or modern-day Spain, had been totally abandoned. Um, all the troops were called there just to help defend Rome. So this is basically the end of Rome's control over Britain and Iberia. Those places were then left to uh, the Gauls, and eventually you know, the Angles and the Saxons would come too. Um, Iberia was left to the Vandals, okay, who would set up shop there. The Visigoths who came in with Alaric were eventually negotiated with and were um, allowed to take territory in what would be southwest France. And, and so in 418, a few, you know, a few years after the sack, they actually left Rome and went and resettled in Aquitania. That's Aquitania, A-Q-U-I-T-A-N-I-A. -A. Uh, after that, they began to move west and they would eventually push the Vandals out of Iberia or Spain. Uh, by 475, and the Vandals then had to move into North Africa, where they actually took over um, Augustine's famous city of Hippo. After that, you can see things move quite speedily to the end. That is the um, the only the only glimmer of hope in this in this long series. Of emperors is Valentinian the Third, and uh, interestingly enough, that's the emperor. Um, under his reign, Attila um, threatened to attack Rome and was convinced to leave by Pope Leo. Um, this moves quickly. You can notice we've got reigns like as long as uh, two years, but down all the way to a few months. Um, you know, the only person getting close to Valentinian III is is uh, Anthemius, Anthemius, and he's you know five years. So it's just it's just real quick succession. All these guys are dying violent deaths, being assassinated, being killed by their own men, um, dying in war, that kind of stuff. So things are clearly unstable. And this last fellow, Romulus Augustulus, is sort of on paper the last official Western emperor. But he was very young when he got to the throne and did very little active ruling. He was more of a figure head for a faction that was fighting another faction. Um, we're not going to get too deep into it, but it was in 476 that he was actually assassinated by one of the more powerful generals at the time, um, a guy named Odoacar, O-D-A, O-D-O-A-C-A-R, Odoacar. And this marked, of course, the, the final official historical end of the Western Roman Empire. Now, keep in mind, however, that the end is not really an end. It's just a move. Right, so the empire not so much is over; it's just shifted from the west to the east, which would last another thousand years um, longer. Thank you, and have a nice night.